Oh, thank you, sir. I'm glad, I'm glad that um, John Mascaratolo left out the part about being committed. I, I, I told him not to mention that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe you can Google something and, and find out about those convictions and the, and the commitments. <laughs> But uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Um, how many of you have to be here? See, I, I figured that you all did, <laughs> or you wouldn't. No, I'm happy that you did come, uh, and I know that, that, that quite a few of you fill seats that, uh, without being required to be here, and, and it's a special privilege uh, to be invited to speak to you today. I have a few little PowerPoints uh, we're going to go through as we talk about international. When I was invited to be the speaker today, um, I was told uh, that um, I could talk about any subject. And so I always have a little bit of difficulty maybe focusing. And so I have to have a PowerPoint so that we don't lose track and we're, and we're finished. Uh, now that John Mascaratolo has taken the first hour of your time, we'll, we'll finish, uh, wrap it up in two or three minutes. <laughs> never a mic I don't like. <laughs> Thank you. But I am currently the director of the Office of International Programs, as he stated, here at Clayton State University. This is my, my, my next career, uh, having uh, finished one career uh, with the military and one career uh, with, in the corporate world with Delta Airlines. And uh, two years ago, I joined Clayton State University, thanks to them, um, uh, to, um, to help establish its first full-time Office of International Programs. And, in those two years, I'm proud to say the, the programs have grown, and not just because of the fact that they now have a dedicated director of international programs, but because there's a particularly dedicated faculty and staff here at Clayton State University that want to see international programs advance at your, your university. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in a few minutes. But one of the subjects that I wanted to give you in sort of a general sense is something about international business, um, you know, as a discipline. What is it? And so this will sound a little bit like a lecture, but it's not really a lecture. It's just a, a bit of a discussion. I thought this was a clever title. Uh, it's probably not. Uh, there no, <laughs> there's nothing uh, misspelled here. Um, you can eat international. It might help if you are Hungary, get it, there's a country called Hungary. <laughs> but, but international is a palate pleaser, you know, eating and, uh, okay. <clears throat> I thought it was clever. <laughs> but I wanted to, to point out that when you're standing in front of the parliament uh, in Budapest, Hungary, 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 see there's a connection already, and you're look, and, and this river, beautiful river, does anybody know what it is? This, say again? Danube. Who said that? Oh, darn. <laughs> a, a faculty member. That's not fair. <laughs> Standing in front of the Danube, looking back across uh, this beautiful view of the Hungarian parliament, you can't help but think that some knowledge of the basics of international is essential today in our business world, in our educational environment. It's just essential. And why? Because as we all know, we've heard about Thomas Friedman in his book, uh, haven't we? The world is increasingly flat. It's increasingly shrinking as we come together with technological advances, advances in communications. And if today's students, that's most of you, are going to develop into successful business persons and advance within your chosen fields, you have to have at least a rudimentary knowledge of how the world, just a few things, its economies, its resources, its people, its cultures, interconnects. All of these things overlap today. You know, you, you can't focus on economies without understanding something about the politics, the people, the cultures of, of the countries. And if you're going to be successful in the business world, even if you think you're going to work for a little small company, there's going to be an international component someplace along the line that you need to understand. Maybe a certain piece of equipment that your company uses is manufactured in another country. Maybe that's the only connection you have to international. 
but it helps to understand something about where that piece of equipment came from, how it got to you. If you need it to be repaired someday, where do you get it repaired? It's all interconnected. You can buy a, F a Ford automobile, look under the hood, and that Ford might be manufactured in Michigan somewhere, but chances are you're going to find a lot of components under the hood that come from another country today. Did you know that every Audi TT, that little sports car convertible that you see in the United States, is manufactured in Hungary? Hungary. I'm, I'm looking for connections. <laughs> That's a piece of trivia that you can take home. You know, it might appear if you ever take business 6101 on, a, on the trivia portion of your exam someday. Being able to utilize in developing business strategies and making decisions, these potential synergies gained from understanding the basic components of international in this interdependent global business environment gives businesses and the individuals who lead them today significant competitive advantages. Did you know that? Can you imagine? What does it do? Well, in business, no matter what kind of business you're in, whether it's education, education is a type of business, whether it's government, whether it's a corporation, a small company, Competitive advantage is key, isn't it? <laughs> this helps provide a competitive advantage. If you have some knowledge of international, if you have some knowledge of the basics of international, this proves, it demonstrates your credibility when talking about business. It shows that you know something more than just what's happening within the borders of our own country and that you understand how the world today is increasingly flat and shrinking, interconnected. It's very essential. That gives you the competitive advantage. Those among us who have some idea about how international business operates, whether as academicians, professionals, colleagues, need to pass that knowledge and experience to others who don't have a sufficient understanding of international. That's one of the things that I'm trying to do here at Clayton State University. That's one of the things that your faculty is doing at Clayton State University. They're integrating into the curriculum, into our, all of our understanding, something about international so that when you go out into the world, in your professions, you have this basic knowledge that gives you that competitive advantage. Not just your company or your business some competitive advantage, but it gives you a career competitive advantage as individuals. It enhances your position within the organization. Any idea what this is? How do you, who said Hungarian? Hungary, yeah. That's the crest. How does one develop a taste, back to the palate and eating international, for, hung, for international, not for Hungarian, for international. Well, part of it comes from education. Part of it comes from having an open, inquisitive mind. You know, and travel, uh, frankly, helps stimulate interest in international. I'm not talking about travel to Disney World in Florida. <laughs> I'm talking about travel outside the country. Just a few photos. That's my screensaver at the top. I don't know if you, anybody, uh, any guesses where that might be? Hungry. <laughs> no, any, any other guesses, better guess? Looks kind of like Philippines, doesn't it? I don't know, I've never been there. Uh, Vietnam, possibly. Any other guesses? Thailand. Thailand, who said Thailand? Not you again. Thailand, Bangkok. This is, this is what I call fast food Thai style. Anyone here from Thailand? Or been to Thailand? You've been to Thailand, yes. This lady, it, 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 it's an example of a business operating uh, in a way that we don't think of businesses operating. This is probably a very profitable business. On this little flat boat, she's going down the canals of Bangkok and, and making barbecue on the boat, 
has, um, has a big container of cold drinks in the back and goes from door to door selling cook to order barbecue, Thai style. I'm sure there's some peanut sauce somewhere in there. It's, you know, it's useful to know that people in other countries conduct businesses differently than the way we conduct business here. Any guess where this place might be? This is from travel. Speak up so I can hear. Not Italy. Greece. Not Spain. Greece. No. Nope. Okay, you give up. Somebody said South America. Okay, right continent. Country? No. Nope. Somebody said Brazil, didn't they? Brazil! You have two correct <laughs> answers. Okay, where in Brazil? You'll never get it. No, nah, no, nah, nah, you'll never get it. But yet, it's the fourth largest city in Brazil. Belo Horizonte. I knew it. You did? Why didn't you speak up? <laughs> okay. More travel. Who's this character? It's not Lawrence of Arabia. It's me. This is in Egypt. I'm sure that in certain countries or certain areas of the world, people use different modes of transportation than what we're accustomed to seeing here. I really don't see a whole lot of people in Egypt, uh, in Cairo in particular, riding around on camels. I suspect this might have been for tourists. Do you think? <laughs> okay, I suspect. Well, you can eat international, but it might help if you are hungry. You need to have some knowledge of the basics of, of international. It's essential today. It's essential. We have to pass that along. Wow. Am I going backwards? Yes. You know, I thought something looked repetitive. <laughs> international is the overlay. It's not so much foreign as it is a perspective. It's an overlay. Do you know what an overlay? Think of it as a transparency. So you take substantive areas in which you may be working, you take business structures, the environment in which you may be working, and you put this transparency called international over it. In other words, there's nothing really to fear. You're not, you're not straying too far from the familiar when you get into international practice. You have to think of, an, of this as a perspective. The word foreign scares a lot of people. And some people won't go into international business at all because they think that eh, it's too complicated. It's foreign. It's not foreign. It's a perspective. International is a different way of looking at things, of approaching things. You have to have some idea of the, the, the fact that the substantive areas in which you're working, let's, let's say you're an HR, human resources specialist. If you go into a multinational company as a human resources specialist, you're going to have some issues at some point dealing with those overseas employees of the, of the company. Well, you approach those issues the same way you do here. The questions are the same. If it's a question about maternity leave or vacation entitlement, uh, salary, minimum wages, those kinds of things, withholdings, those are the questions. Those are questions you have here in the United States in a domestic company. It's the same questions you have with respect to those international employees that your company may have. So that's what I'm talking about by perspective, by overlay. You have the same issues, so, so you're familiar with the issues, but you have to consider that there's a different way of maybe approaching those issues, or maybe they might be resolved slightly differently because that country has different sets of human resources laws. Maybe employees there are entitled to six months of maternity leave by law. Well, the, the question's the same, how much are you entitled to? But it's just a slightly different answer. So that's the point, it's a perspective. Is it exotic or is it exhausting? Maybe international practice is both. It can be both. I think it's particularly exotic, and the exotic side is stimulating and makes it less exhausting. But after a 23-hour flight from Atlanta to Mumbai, India, 
you find that it has some components of exhausting as well. Especially when you're on a business trip and the first thing that you're supposed to be doing when you land in Mumbai, India is going into a business meeting to negotiate an agreement with an employee's union. That's exhausting. Just the idea of negotiating with a union is exhausting, but after a 23-hour flight, maybe not such a comfortable seat, maybe the food's not so good, maybe the toilet didn't work on the airplane. Ooh, <laughs> that's exhausting. But do the rewards outweigh the drawbacks? Yes, yes, because the exotic, the, the perspective, the fact that you're seeing something different, working in a different environment, it all outweighs the fact that, yeah, international travel is exhausting, but it's only exhausting in a fatigue sense. That's what exhausting means anyway, isn't it? Fatigue. You need to know your limitations. Know your limitations when you're in international practice, but still do your research. Evaluate the risks. It's, it's very important. And what I'm getting at here is don't hesitate to rely on experts or to ask questions when you're working in an international business environment. There often will be people who know much more than you, and often those people are nationals of that foreign country in which your business is operating. Don't hesitate to rely on the resources. Know your limitations, but still know that you have a certain perspective because of your knowledge of some of the basics of international that allows you to ask the right questions. That's what's important. Know what the questions are. Understand that the answers might not be the same as they are here in the United States. And in fact, the process for arriving at those answers might be different, very different as well. So know your limitations, do your basic research. Know something about the culture, the geography, the politics and religion, the competitive landscape in the country. This is a cultural no at the top. When in Japan, don't pretend like you're a walrus with your chopsticks. It's not polite. That actually, uh, <laughs> um, I, I had promised myself after that was taken that I would never circulate that photo, but it just seemed appropriate at this time <laughs> to share a little bit about. Don't do that. Don't do that. They, it's not appreciated. Don't play with your chopsticks. You know what you, what you do, though, and there's so many do's and don'ts when you're exploring the cultures of different countries. When you're in Japan, make sure you have plenty of business cards because you'll want to hand those business cards out in a very polite manner. That's an accepted, in fact, required part of their culture to open a business meeting. You have to exchange business cards for a number of reasons. We could, do, we could give a whole class on this subject of culture. In fact, in my course um, in uh, International Business and Global Logistics, we do have a class on the cultural do's and don'ts in various countries. It's not so difficult. In fact, it's very interesting to do a little bit of research into the culture of the particular country in which you're going to be working or visiting. Know something about that. This is a perfectly permissible example of enjoying the culture of a country. See this flag back there in that little crest? Where am I? Hungary. <laughs> And we're enjoying the culture of that particular country on a, on a nice afternoon. We're having a couple of beers. Hmm. Perfectly good practice. In fact, I would highly recommend it. <laughs> and of course, know something about the meat. The meat, the legal regulatory environment. You need to know that before you go into a country with your business, when you're exploring. This affects all kinds of things. It affects the kind of structure you may choose, whether you have a set up a, if your company wants to uh, engage in foreign direct investment and set up some sort of operation locally in another country, know the legal structure, how you do this as a matter of law or regulation. Know something about the intellectual property rights if you have a piece of intellectual property, some know-how that you've developed in your country, 
and you're going to send that overseas to another country, be concerned about what's going to happen to that piece of property, intellectual property, that we developed back here in the United States. Is it going to be secure in that country, or are others going to steal that intellectual property and counterfeit or pirate or do something with it that's not permissible? You need to know about these things. We already mentioned human resources. Know something about the financial environment of other countries if you're doing business as a multinational. You need to understand that financial reporting requirements, for instance, are different than in other places than they are in the United States. You have to know something about the logistics and technology. Let's suppose you are an exporter in the United States and you want your tractors to be sold in India. Well, you have to know not just how to get those tractors on the ship in Savannah, but you have to know what's going to happen once those tractors reach the port in India. You know, is there a logistics system that will permit that product to get to the end user, the purchaser? How does that all work? You have to do that kind of research in advance. And I, I always include in my business analysis the necessity to have an exit strategy. <laughs> Let's suppose your business venture is not working out like you hoped, like you planned. Know how to get out without losing all resources that you might still have available. And I'm talking about primarily the money that you've invested in a particular operation or a particular venture in a foreign country. Know how to get out of there. You know, this, this opens up so many areas for discussion that we could have. For example, know that in many countries under the local labor employment laws, the HR laws, that it's not so easy just to close down a business and terminate the employees and depart that country. Certain countries require huge severance payments, uh, payments for all kinds of benefits that might be outstanding. State of Georgia is called an employment at will state. You can hire and fire at will. Other countries, that's very, that's very unheard of for the most part. You need to know something about it. Well, have I discussed anything that's completely incomprehensible so far? No, no, it's easy. Have no fear. Don't worry about stepping into international practice. It's not difficult. You just have to have an open mind, some basic education, and the willingness to explore, to be adventurous, to try new things. Do it. Don't be intimidated. Be flexible. Because your ability to succeed in your company in international business depends on this. These are just some of the areas in which I've found that international can be eaten. When I talk about you can eat international, I'm talking about you can have a career that puts food on the table in international business. I remember as a history major in college um, going to a dinner that uh, my, my father was a banker. The board of directors had a Christmas dinner and I sat next to one of the directors uh, from the bank and he said, what are you studying, John? And I said, I'm studying history. And he looked at me, he said, can't eat history. And I thought, how crazy is that? What the <laughs> heck is he talking about? And then I said, well, I, I want to I do, I have an international career. And he said, what? What's that? Can't eat international. What are you going to do with it? You can eat international. There are many ways to have international career. I've sampled a few, and John Mascaratello in the introduction named them, so I won't go into them here. Let's talk a bit about current international careers. What are we doing here at Clayton State University in the international field? And we'll, we'll sort of wrap up with this, but I want you to know something about it. Did you even realize there's an Office of International Programs yes. before today? Good. Have you ever been to the link on the Clayton State website for Office of International Programs? Yes. Please do if you haven't. 
because that link, which incidentally is being revised right now to include new international programs for this year, coming year, uh, is a great source of information. Please go there. You'll see some of the things that we're doing. I divide the programs into, a, mm, you see five bullets here. Our focus in our Office of International Programs is in five primary areas. We're student focused. What I mean by student focused, there are various opportunities that we try to provide for students. One is study abroad programs. There are a lot of study abroad programs. You need to check them out. There are two study abroad programs. One in particular is well established in the School of Business. And that was last year's program or this year's program for business students to Turkey, the most successful um, international study abroad program that Clayton State University has had to date. 20 students went to Turkey for the May semester this year. Very successful. We plan to add another program um, to the Turkey program, not to compete, but just as a supplemental program possibly to Hungary during that same period. There are also programs to South Africa. These are Clayton State programs. Program to Jamaica, a Spanish immersion program to Guadalajara, a program to Australia in healthcare management, a program to Bahamas in marine biology, a program to Costa Rica in tropical ecology, that's new, and a program to Guatemala for the School of Nursing sponsors each year. Very successful program to Guatemala where the nursing students work in a remote uh, Mayan village, not just learning how to administer medical care in a tropical environment, such as Guatemala, but actually administering it, doing things that would not be allowed to be done by students in the United States. They're getting hands-on experience working with these Guatemalans. Very interesting program. And then there's a program um, in spring break to Italy. So these are just a sample of the programs that Clayton State University offers. In addition to that, Clayton State uh, collaborates with the university system of Georgia with five additional programs. Madrid, uh, London, Paris, St. Petersburg, and Waterford, Ireland. So all of these are open and available for credits that you can earn from Clayton State University. Second area of student-focused programs is exchanges, student exchanges. Clayton State University has two active student exchange programs at this moment, and there will be more. The two are with uh, University of Pannonia in Hungary, and the other one is uh, Georgian American University in Tbilisi, Republic of Georgia. Now these are, these are new programs, and this semester, for the first time, there are two students who are on semester exchange at Clayton State University, one from each of those universities. They're here. And let me introduce them. They're standing right here. Uh, those, two, those two students, um, we're, we're so happy to have Mariam Chubinidze. That's Mariam from Republic of Georgia. And the other is Sofia Terek from University of Pannonia in Hungary. And we're just delighted to have them. Let me tell you, that these are balanced exchange programs. They're body for body. They pay the tuition at their own home institutions, they, and, and they pay their transportation to get here, and they pay their accommodations and food once they get here. But as, as in exchange for this, as part of this exchange program, we're looking for students to go to their universities from Clayton State. It has to be a balanced exchange or it doesn't work for the benefit of the two institutions or the institutions that are involved. So if you want to know more about this, please ask me. And thirdly, under student focus, there are a number of international students that are at Clayton State University and we're trying to provide support to them in various ways. Faculty focus programs, I'm just going to mention that we also have faculty exchanges. Have you, any of you ever seen any of our Indian exchange professors that have visited here? Yes. yes. We have uh, faculty exchanges with two colleges in India. They're both colleges are part of the University of Mumbai. And uh, that's a very well-developed exchange program. We also have a faculty exchange program that started last year, um, or this, this uh, spring semester, with the University of Pannonia. 
and we had a Hungarian professor who taught in the School of Business. And, and there also will be a Hungarian professor who's coming in October to teach in the School of Business. And we're seeking a professor to go in exchange for two weeks to the University of Pannonia to teach there. Interestingly, they have, both of these universities have English language curriculum. So it's no problem either as exchange faculty or as exchange students to go to those universities and attend classes and, you, and receive credits back here uh, in the United States. Just uh, so you know, these are officials at the top uh, uh, in Turkey from some Turkish institutions with which we're working. Uh, this, is a, this is a scene of a group, that's me right there, um, at a place called Ephesus in Turkey. Have you ever heard of this, Ephesus? One of the old cities of Turkey. And look, there are two, <laughs> they didn't know that I had this slide in here, so I knew they would be embarrassed. I was waiting for this moment just to embarrass them. I just, uh, please keep in mind that we have these well-developed international programs at Clayton State University and we're developing more. And I want your participation. If you're interested in international studies, international programs, come talk to us. We're in the University Center, room 204. I have an extremely good partner in my office named Celie Blair. And Celie was here. Where are you, Celie? There's Celie, back there with the green jacket. One of us usually is there. She's usually there more than I am, actually. But we're there, and we want to help you if you're interested in international studies. Um, sort of as a conclusion, let me tell you about two, briefly, two very exciting projects of where we're going at Clayton State, Something we, some place we haven't been before. And one of those is we're developing, at this moment, something called the, Internet, the Institute for Ethics and Gandhian Studies. This is, will be an umbrella institute which will emphasize ethical behavior in all aspects of, of business, but also respect for the principles of Gandhi, dignity, social justice, equality. And any program, whether it's business, arts and sciences, nursing, any discipline can be brought under this umbrella. And this is a program we've organized in collaboration with Birla College, which is one of our partner institutions in India, part of the University of Mumbai. And the second program that you're going to see in the future being developed is a Central and Eastern European Studies Center. And we're just beginning to work on this concept. Because of our relationships with the University of Pannonia in Hungary, and Georgian American University and Republic of Georgia, we have sort of the core for a, a group of foreign universities with which we can collaborate. And we hope to, under that core umbrella, uh, institute a series of programs that will emphasize Central and Eastern Europe. And with that, let me ask you, do you have any question marks? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm, my name is Myron Robertson, and my question is, uh, in regards to your student exchange program, do you have any, any plans for the future? Yes. Um, for, as far as expansion beyond the two institutions right. that we just named, yes. Um, we, we are just finalizing an agreement with a university in France, uh, in Normandy, uh, called the University of Cannes. And uh, the dean of the School of Business and I made a trip to Cannes last year to talk about uh, some of the preliminary arrangements. And they've been pressing us pretty aggressively recently because uh, we haven't fully implemented the de details on this side of the ocean uh, for that exchange. But we plan to have both student and faculty exchanges in France at University of Cannes. We also have an institutional partnership with a university in Peru called Arequipa, Arequipa, Peru. That's primarily an information technology focused collaboration. If you're in the IT field, uh, one of our IT faculty members was in Peru this summer for two weeks with that program as a faculty exchange. Now we want to expand that for student exchange as well in the information technology field. 
Um, those are the two that come to mind immediately that, that are the most developed at this point. We're looking to establish relationships with a university in, in China, in the People's Republic of China, because we don't have anything that's established at this point in that part of Asia, the Pacific Asia. Yes, sir. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, when you go, you know, across the pond, as we say, um, the, the uh, lucrative uh, opportunities are available for, let's say, American students that, you know, have an American degree and go overseas for employment. The, the opportunities are endless. Yes. And a lot of people are comfortable just, you know, in Monroe, <laughs> you know. So, so uh, could you address that a little bit about um, the opportunities are available for people that are that might consider going overseas? Yeah. Proven experience in international education, from the perspective of, of a student, is a very marketable asset. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for students to work overseas, but what we've seen is that an American, a degree from an American university is highly valued by foreign students coming here to the, to the United States. Um, for example, uh, through one of our institutional relationships with a, an organization called the Istanbul Center, uh, we were able to develop um, an ex, uh, a program for uh, Turkish MBA students to come to Clayton State University. I hope that we'll see other areas, other, other types of students. Well, why do they want to come here? Why does a student from Turkey want to come to Clayton State University? Well, it, it's number one, I think, is that degree from an American university is highly valued back in their country still. America is regarded as the leader in, in education in higher education. Sure, there are a lot of deficiencies uh, at lower levels of education in the United States. We all know that and we hear about those problems. But higher education is very highly valued uh, in the United States. So I think that, that a degree from a U.S. institution opens doors. Now Clayton State University is attractive for a lot of reasons and I think you're here because you yourselves have identified reasons to come here as opposed to possibly going somewhere else for your education. But we found through some of our uh, word of mouth, part of its marketing materials, part of its visits in different countries and working with institutions in those countries, that we're able to establish some, some, some degree of knowledge in those foreign countries about Clayton State University, and that's beginning to grow. We look at our foreign exchange students as ambassadors for Clayton State University. They'll go back to their countries and they'll talk about our university and we think that that'll generate interest and we, we want them to have a positive experience here so that they then can show that same type of excitement and enthusiasm about Clayton State when they go to their countries. Now, it's also valuable, I believe, for, for faculty members to engage in these exchanges too for the same reasons. Um, I just take, for example, the, uh, Hungary. Hungary. Um, I was the first exchange professor to University of Pannonia under that agreement, which is a new agreement. In, this, in February, I taught for two weeks an international business course at University of Pannonia. It was a concentrated course, three credit hours there, Hungarian students, a full classroom, and all in the English language. They spoke English fluently. That's something we need to think about at times. You know, do, do we have uh, adequate emphasis on studying at least one foreign language uh, to enter international business? But those students were prepared to hear me with my Georgia accent, uh, I think, um, <laughs> uh, lecture, have classroom discussions for 10 days of classes, two weeks, 10 days of classes. Every day we were in class for four hours or so. That's a lot of seeing those people in two weeks very concentrated course, but it's a rewarding experience. I think that partially because of that, not because of me, but because of the fact that there was someone from Clayton State University there providing lectures from a different perspective, from the U.S. perspective, which interests many people outside our borders. I think that that was good for our university. And I think the, feel the same way 
about our faculty members that go to India and our faculty members that will be going to France and hopefully to Republic of Georgia under an exchange. So the word gets out and we attract those students. They value that degree. They value that experience if they're not degree seeking students here at Clayton State because to have on your resume that you attended a U.S. university still means a lot outside the borders of our country. Am I correct about that? John, <laughs> yes. Can you repeat the question for the sake of the video? Yes. Now I can't repeat the question because it was asked about 20 minutes ago. Uh, no, I think the question, as I understood it, was that um, was was what kind of experiences. Um, are available for for students who study here working in the international environment and I'm not sh certain that I completely address that because there are so many different types of experiences that are available regardless of what field you're in but to me the more relevant portion of that question is what's the value of our education for students who do come here and then return to their home countries and and what does that gain them as an asset it makes them more marketable Certainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yes, ma'am. Do we have any intentions of developing a relationship with Canada and Mexico? Do we have any intentions of developing a relationship with Canada and Mexico? We are developing a relationship in Mexico now uh, with a, an institute in Guadalajara. Uh, that's primarily focused on um, uh, Spanish language um, um, curriculum hoping that that, um, that provides students an opportunity to actually hear and learn Spanish in a, in a, in a Spanish-speaking environment. Um, Canada, we've had some discussions with a university in Canada, but they haven't progressed very far, frankly. I would like to see um, a relationship in Canada, and the, uh, the particular university was Prince Edward Island University uh, in Northeast Canada. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Um, this, I probably don't know, but is there already or are there any plans for an actual international business program, like to get a degree in international business? I, couldn't say. I think that, are there any plans to offer an international business degree, specifically, at Clayton State University? And I'm going to defer to the dean of the School of Business to, to address that. Dean, would you, would you uh, please? Thank you. I know you will still get some more applause, but no, going back to the question, um, we are in fact discussing uh, the major in IB. Uh, I think the, the demand is there. Atlanta uh, is a world class business city, and so we have to respond to the needs that I think are there. Uh, and uh, in fact, our associate in Diane. Uh, we'll probably share some more information later on, but the plans are in the, uh, in the works, so we'll get something. Yeah, I would say we're going to probably start with the IB minor and then work our way into the major, so we'll probably do it more slowly, but yes, we do have plans. It's partially developed. You know, it's a, a small part of that greater plan that our office, in which our office is involved, is developing relationships with with institutions that then will assist us in designing programs for not just business students but students from other parts of the university to study uh, in those countries and uh, we want to add to the menu of choices that you have as students when you're looking for a program that's relevant to you if you're interested in studying abroad and going back to the school of business for a moment this very successful program in Turkey um, was preceded by a program uh, of the, that the School of Business had in India. And that program may be resurrected or uh, certainly uh, retooled in some fashion to add India to the menu of choices for business students, but also Hungary because of our, uh, our connections already with the university in Hungary. So we want to add to those menus. If you've been to Turkey, in the past, maybe you want to have another international study experience. Um, and so the more opportunities that are available, the more choices that are available, the better I think our, our over, overall program becomes. Any other questions? 
Yes, sir. Many of these uh, trips abroad are revenue expensive. Mm -hmm. um, are they going to try to find a way to make it affordable? For the I like that question. That's a, that's a good question. The question was many of these trips are, are expensive, naturally. Uh, is there a way to make them more affordable? And, and um, you know, we recognize that fact. When we're designing study abroad programs for students, one of, the, one of the, the primary factors that we have in mind is whether those programs can be affordable, uh, made affordable. And we do a great deal of shopping for vendors, whether it's airlines or accommodations, um, or just places that you would visit to ensure that the, that the trip is affordable. Now there are some, there, there's a range of costs for these trips. If you're going on a study abroad experience to London, you know it's going to be expensive compared to a study abroad experience in Guadalajara, Mexico. And there are a number of factors. Primary, the, primar, the, the, the largest single cost when designing a, a study abroad program is, can you guess? Hmm? Transportation. Air. Air transportation. To go to Guadalajara, if you buy group fares for a group of students far in advance, you might get a price as low as $500 round trip. If you're going to do that to London, you're talking about a minimum of $1,500 to 1700 on a good shopping day. So, you know, all of those factors go in. Accommodations are very expensive in London. Same in Paris, same in St. Petersburg, Russia, you, Europe generally. But if you have a, a much more closer at home experience like Guatemala from the School of Nursing, that program is under $2,000, whereas a program to London might be as much as $4,000. That's going to be a factor, I know, in your choices. And as students, you have to start planning well in advance if you're going to save up to go to London, for example. Uh, it might not be as much a factor if you're in the School of Nursing. So that, that is a consideration. We want to offer programs that give you a choice based on you know, not just your, the discipline that you want to study, but also a choice in terms of places that you want to see and visit, but also a choice in terms of affordability. So there's a range. Does that answer your question, sir? Okay. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Dr. Patel. Um, I'm a soon to be graduate this December, and I plan to go to Clayton State for my graduate program also, and I was wondering if the two-week exchange is also bad for the graduates. Yes, yes. If, if your pro particular program accepts the credits, um, accepts the courses that have been, the numbers that are, and the course uh, names that are assigned to those study abroad experiences, then yes, I mean, they're open to graduate and undergraduate students. But you have to talk to your, 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 your uh, academic advisor and um, others in the department who will, who will be able to give you advice as to whether that particular study abroad program will satisfy your credits. But they are open. The Turkey trip and the India trip, it would be available to MBA students and undergraduate business and healthcare students. So we always try to make it so that there's something, a course that anyone could take in the school of business. Yeah. So theoretically, they're open to all students. But, it, but you know, you, depending on what the course, how the course is designed, what it's offering in terms of credit, you may or may not find that course to be of any use. Mm. Andrew, where are you? Uh, yes, sir. Parkinson, I uh, talked with you last year about the turkey trip, and you had scholarships in the amount of $500. Are you going to have any scholarship <clears throat> money available for your trips that you're having this year? Another good question is whether there are scholarship monies available for study abroad uh, trips. Um, there are very limited scholarship, number of scholarships that are available. Uh, le let me first tell you about the scholarships that I do know about. There is a scholarship that's, or, that's administered by our Office of International Programs. It's traditionally called the STARS scholarship. It's more of an award because it's, it's not given based on academic scholarship. It's an award based on an application that includes an essay of why you would find study abroad to be a good experience. Um, but there are a limited number of those. They're $500 each, and at this time, 
we only have the funding to provide 10 of those. So if you have uh, our average number of study abroad students in the past couple of years, I'm averaging, is about 65 at each year, about 65 students. So 10, 10 awards don't go a long way. Uh, but surprisingly, only 20-something students applied for those, of those 65, applied for those $500 awards. So it was not that difficult, really, to make the, the, the selections at the end of the day. Now, there are some departments that also have some individual funding. You might check with your departments uh, in which you're studying to see if there's any kind of award available. I know that Turkey had a few limited um, awards. For students, uh, we, we gave out one hundred dollars scholarships from the School of Business, and last year we had six. Uh, this year, right now, we have about five, unless we get more donations to the foundation. So, if we get more foundation uh, donations from faculty and staff during the campaign, then we may have more. I understand that we have time for one more question. I would love to just continue to stand here and answer questions. But I know that there's a time that you have to return to classes, many of you. So is, the, is there another question? Yes, sir. Uh, I was just going to ask, uh, do students usually, um, when, they go, when they do the study abroad program, do they do just the May master, or do they usually go for the whole semester? Which one is more? Uh... Most of our programs are designed as May master. Um, the, 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 uh, there are a, f a few. Um, courses that are outside the May semester period. There are some four and five week long summer uh, semester courses. The, uh, the course to Australia that we're designing now, I believe, is a three week course. Uh, so there's some varying lengths of the courses, and that, and that will be a summer semester. There's also a spring break course, which is the Italy course, which is a very concentrated, uh, you leave on a Friday and you come back on a Monday over spring break. So you're. <laughs> <laughs> we just, we sort of slip, you know, we, no, it, it, it's, it's not one weekend, <laughs> you don't leave Friday and come back two days later, three days later, but you get a full, you, it's a t basically a 10 day experience, and we fudge a little bit on that course, you might miss that first day of class on Monday, you know, after spring break, uh, but we don't publicize that, that's not really a popular thing with many, much of the administration. <laughs> But anyway, there are varying lengths. The courses offered by the European Council that I mentioned, the five under the University System of Georgia, those are four and five week courses for summer semester. And as you might imagine, because they're longer duration and they're to European destinations, they also have a higher price tag, quite frankly. They're more in the $5,000 range. And that's very, that's prohibitive to many students. And we recognize that. And that's what, one reason we like to provide Clayton State University courses that are for shorter duration and also are less expensive as part of that menu of choices. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.